to go in this preamble and then he quotes a poem that becomes the introduction of this word. I know that I've been hailing and lifting up uh, great uh, men who are in their seasoned days of life, Dr. Charles Adams, uh, Dr. Branch, who's retiring this year, others who have done that, Dr. Wright, uh, retired now some uh, close to 12 or close to 15, maybe 12 years ago now. But I recall in this particular writing, he raised a question. And his question was uh, pointed and aimed particularly at the African-American or black man. Here's what he says, and I quote, what makes you so strong, black man? How is it that 370 years of slavery, segregation, racism, Jim Crow laws, and second-class citizenship cannot wipe out the memory of Imhotep, Aesop, Akintetan, Tutmos II. What makes you so strong, black man? How is it that after all this country has done to you, you can still produce a Paul Robeson, a Thurgood Marshall, a Malcolm X, an El Shabazz? How is it you can still produce a Martin Luther King and a Ron McNair? What makes you so strong, black man? This country has tried castration and lynching, miseducation and brainwashing. They have taught you to hate yourself and to look at yourself through the awfully tainted eyeglasses of white Eurocentric lies. And yet you keep breaking out of the prisons they put you in. You break out in a W.E.B. Du Bois or a Booker T. Washington. You break out in a Mickey Leland or a Farrakhan. You break out in a Judge Thurgood Marshall or a Pop Staples. You break out in a Luther Vandross, a Mike, Magic Johnson, a Michael Jordan, a Harold Washington, or a Doug Wilder. I told you it's been a little while since he wrote this. What makes you so strong, black man? I don't care what field we pick, you produce a giant in that field. What makes you so strong? The world tried the poisons of self-hatred, of distorted history, of false standards of beauty. They taught you that you were ugly and stupid and slow and retarded and dim-witted and dull-witted and good only for stud service and getting high on the weekend. And yet, you keep on turning out strong. You turn out strong people like Sterling Brown. You turn out strong people like Vincent Hardy. Turn out strong people like a Jim Forbes or a Kwame Nkrumah, an Alan Bozak or a William Gray or a Steve Biko or a Bill Cosby or a Dave Dinkins. Doug White. What makes you so strong? And then he writes, there's a poem by Sterling Brown that says, the strong men kept coming. In this poem he quotes, the quote goes, they drag you from your homeland. They chained you in coffins. They huddled you spoon fashion in filthy hatches. They sold you to give you gentlemen ease. They broke you in like oxen. They scourged you, they branded you. They made your women breeders. They swelled your numbers with bastards. They taught you the religion they disgraced. You kept singing though, keep an inching along. Like a po inch worm, I keep inching along. You sang songs like by and by when the morning comes. You sang songs like I'm going to lay down this heavy load down by the river. You sang songs like walk together, chillin. Don't you get weary. The strong men keep a coming on. The strong men get stronger. They point with pride to the roads you built for them. They ride in comfort over the rails you laid for them. They put hammers in your hands and you said, drive so much before sundown. But you kept singing. Ain't no hammer in this land. Strikes like mine, baby. Ain't no hammer in this land strikes like mine. You kept singing while they cooped you up in their kitchens. You kept singing when they pinned you in their factories. You kept singing when they gave you the jobs that were too good for other people. 
They tried to guarantee happiness to themselves by shunting dirt and misery to you. But you kept singing. Me and my baby gonna shine, shine. Me and my baby gonna shine. Strong men kept coming. Strong men keep getting stronger. They bought off some of your leaders. You stumbled as blind men will. They coaxed you unwantedly, soft-voiced. You followed away. They laughed as usual. They heard the laugh and they wondered uncomfortably, unmittingly, a deep terror. What's wrong? They're not dying because the strong men keep coming. The strong men are getting stronger. What? From the slums? Where they have hemmed you up? What? From tiny huts that they couldn't keep from you? What? What reaches you? What makes you feel ill at ease or fearful? Today, they shout prohibition at you. Thou shalt not this, thou shalt not that, reserved for whites only. You laugh at them because the strong man kept coming. The strong man getting stronger. One thing they can't stop, one thing they can't prohibit, one thing they can't handle is the strong man keep coming. The strong men getting stronger, strong men stronger. What makes you so strong, black man? Amen. The words of Sterling Brown and Jeremiah Wright. I share these words in the preamble of this text because as I look at a text that I've preached many times over the time and course of history in familiar passages, one of the things that I began to realize about this text is we always rush and we always conclude at how this crazy man in this tomb text uh, ends up, uh, yes, crazed and messed up and jacked up and everything else. We go to the issue of him clothed and in his right mind. But one of the things that I need to just lift up while we are in a day and age where we keep demonizing people who haven't got it together yet. Where we keep putting down and talking down and labeling and mislabeling those who have not quite gotten themselves on track yet. One of the things the text brings out, and it's been there all the time, Percy, that we need to at least acknowledge and maybe it'll help them to have a starting point. Maybe it'll help them to know that all is not lost. Maybe it'll help them to know that there is hope for them is that even before they got themselves together, they were already strong. Y'all missed it, y'all missed it, y'all missed it, y'all missed it. I said before they got themselves together, before they stopped acting crazy, before they started doing that, they were already strong. But how do strong men get stronger? Go with me now before they got to Mark chapter 5. Before Mark chapter 5, actually comes. Remember, chapter and verse were not something that was done by the assignment of the master nor those who were writing at the time they wrote. They were later assigned. And often they came in between a story that had already been started. When you read Mark chapter 5 and it says, and they came to the other side. It suggests, Francis, that somebody must have been trying to get there before chapter 5. It says, and it says, and they came to the other side. Anytime you start a sentence out with a conjunction, I mean, I took English and got a C a couple of times, you know. But I'm saying, if you start and, it means there's a connecting thought. That says that they were trying to do something before they got tomorrow to where they are. And so as I began to tiptoe backwards and moon walked into chapter four. I got to verse 35 and I see a text and a message that comes from the master himself that says to the disciples, let us go to the other side. Ah, there it is. Are you there with me? You ain't closed your Bible or shut down your phone yet trying to save your... Your, 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 your battery 
for Facebook and Instagram. I know what you're doing. You see the, the fact. No, 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 no. Open that. Turn it back on. Click it back on. Slide on back. Come on. Go ahead. Yes. Yes, yes, there it is. And the same day when the even was come, he said to them, let us go over. Well, let us pass over to the other side. This was a message from the master talking to some disciples. Let me just say, if you were to go before verse 35, I know you don't have time to listen. I ain't got time to tell you that before verse 35, he was doing so many miracles that masses and multitudes were following him. Yes, mothers, he was so bad, such a bad mamma jamma, that he had mesmerized multitudes who were piling in from everywhere, coming in from all over, not just by his teaching, but by his miracle working. Oh, you know some of the stuff that he did. Mark is one of those ones who tells the miracle stories quick, fast, in a hurry. Some of y'all like Mark because he helped you to get to the game on time. You like Mark because he says such things like straightway and immediately. He gets right to the point. He doesn't tell narrative stories like Luke does. Luke gets some juice out of it. He doesn't go through the genealogy and tell you all the background like, like Matthew does. He's not philosophical and theological like John is in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the same was getting him God. Now he didn't go through all that. John, I mean Mark goes straight to it. Jesus healed him. He goes straightway. Doesn't even have a birth narrative. When he opens up, Mark goes straight to the pool of baptism and talks about how his ministry started in the water and goes straight to miracle working. Talked about man for lep four guys who helped the guy to get to see Jesus, talks about the situation of Jesus healing a man's mother-in-law, talks about all these different miracles. He comes in this particular text, if you go back and read it, he's dealing with a, 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 a challenge of teaching that he starts with by telling parables, that is stories. He starts out by talking about sowers and seeds, and then he goes and he talks about the candle put under a bushel, then he talks about the seed and the mustard seed, and then when he gets to that place, he starts talking about why the parables were parables. And, he's, and people were saying, who teaches like this? Yes, Minister Brian. He, he says, what, 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 what about a man talks like this? We, we ain't never heard no teachers like this. We, we, we've heard all the other leaders. We've heard all the other Pharisees and Sadducees and the, the lawgivers. And we've heard some of those who are in the temple but we ain't never heard no black man. I mean, we ain't never heard no man teach like this before. We heard about him. We heard that when he was 12, that he was traveling with his parents. And they lost him. And when they found him, he wasn't out there selling weed. <laughs> when they found him, he wasn't over at Shanene's house. When, when, when they found him, he, he wasn't out there shooting craps. He, he wasn't out, you know, getting jiggy with it. When, when they found him, he was consulting, teaching with the elders in the church. In the synagogue, he was matching wits at 12. And he even had the audacity to say to his parents, who should have been apologetic because he didn't lose them, they lost him. But I can imagine in their own, yes, northern Nazarene geovistic self, they said, boy, if you don't get up here and we didn't go on a whole day without a car, and we didn't let it come back to find you. And Jesus said to them, don't you know I'm about my daddy's business? Looking at Joseph at the same time. Oh, I wish I wasn't so slow this morning. He started out then knowing at 12 that he was a strong man. He knew at 12 he had something to offer. 
I'm trying to help some sisters, some mothers, some others who are trying to beat down your 12-year-olds, who are trying to make them act like they don't have nothing to offer, who are making them wait to other. Listen, maybe they're not prepared for some things yet in life, and, and they're not able to handle some things yet in life, but they have something to offer if you just allow them the opportunity to rub up against some strong men. Some people of learning, whatever their background, Jesus didn't have mind consulting with those who were in the temple, those who knew the law, those who knew the Torah. Jesus was wrestling and talking with the elders because the only way you get better is you got to rub shoulders with somebody stronger than you. The only way you get better at anything, you got to hang out with people who have something to offer in that field greater than you. That's why we have so many weak persons, because you always want to be the strongest one in the group. Oh, yeah, I know, you know, brothers, I'm just trying to say that, you know, the sisters do that, but don't pick that up. You know, sisters do that because they like getting around girlfriends, and they want to be the prettiest one, so when the fellas walk up, they identify them first. But, brothers, you ain't got to be like that. Sisters, it's not Women's Day, so I ain't talking to you. So I'm just saying. They, you know, they just like sometime, you know, to do that. They, they want to be there, so they don't want to get too many, you know, fine girlfriends around them. They got to find somebody to look a little bit worse than them, don't wear makeup, hair all jacked, whatever. So they got one friend like that, so at least if somebody come along, they do. Brothers, you can be like, oh, no, no, see, you need to understand if you're going to get better, you got to find somebody who does better than you, who reads better than you, who plays basketball better than you, who hits the golf ball better than you, who has the ability to play chess better than you. You got to be able to get around some people. Stop trying to be the best, the biggest, and the baddest when you're not there yet. You need to know that you always have to improve, and the only way you get to improve is not to try to be the biggest and the baddest when you ain't ready yet. You need to be submitted to somebody who's bigger and stronger and wiser, and you need to say, teach me what you know. I'm a strong man, but I can become stronger. Jesus was not afraid at 12 to submit himself to the teaching of the elders. And some of them who marveled at him helped shape some of his thinking, helped develop some of his thoughts, helped develop that. Listen, I heard somebody make the mistake yesterday of being able to say, you know, Jesus never went to no seminary. Jesus never had to do no teaching. He just got up at 30 and started preaching. That's the biggest lie ever been told on anybody. Just because your Bible don't tell you what happened between 12 and 30 don't mean he was sitting around at the house in his mama's basement. Come on, talk to me here. Just because there's nothing in the biblical text that talks about what happened between 12 and 30 don't mean he was just out in the streets on the corners. Come on. You know, drinking 40s, kicking it with the fellas. Just because he was there don't mean he was somewhere in jail getting a record. You know, no, 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 no. Just because there's no record between 12 and 30, you can just surmise he must have been doing something. Why? Because his teachings were about things that only people who have been involved in them would know about. How do you think he could talk about agrarian society and talk about farming situations unless he had the ability to do some farm work? And thank God Joseph helped him to be able to know, son, if you're going to live in this house, whoever your daddy is, you're going to have to get some work done. I wish I had some strong men in here. Really. Only way he was able to talk and be able to be a great carpenter, son, is that at some point before his father died, Joseph was a great carpenter, but he taught his son something so that Jesus was able to do some things for himself. The reason he was able to live three years on the streets is because he had the capacity even before he became, yes, on his missionary work. He knew how to handle things for himself. The only way he could talk about sowers and sowers of seeds is he had to have, have planted some. The only way he could talk about sheep and shepherds is because he must have had been around some. I wish I could go down the list in the line, but everything he does and talk, he got it from something that was a self-life application. What am I saying, brothers? If you just learn, look back over your life, when God wants to use you, he doesn't waste nothing. Everything in your background, everything in your life, everything you've ever done, everything you've ever put, good, the bad, and the ugly, God can make all things work together for your good, but if you were a person who was active and busy in any kind of way, you were already strong. God just want to make you strong. 
You don't have to look down with disdain on anything because I serve a God that can take even the bad and the ugly in your life and work it around for your good. I can have him take things that you want to hide and put up under the bushel and he can take that and show you how he can lick. Come here, Moses. Moses testify real quick because they got to go. Moses says, listen, I was a murderer. Oh, but he took me by a burning bush one day and told me he can use that in order for me to become the stronger man he wanted me to become. I was already a strong man of Egypt. But by the time he got through with me, I became stronger. You got to be careful because there's some people who don't want to see you grow stronger in other ways that you can grow. But then some of them same people want to make you the man of the house when they want something. Oh, Jesus, I'm glad it ain't Women's Day. Try this side. I said, you got to be careful, brothers, because some of them will, will put you down, won't let you get exposed to things that will help you to become stronger. They will minimize you. They won't let you go out and work the pose. They say you ain't doing to belong in certain areas when you're dealing with people. who They won't let you hang out down at the courtrooms where you can see what a judge looks like on the other side. And before you get on this side, some of your honor, my name is, or before you get numbers and strikes. They won't let you come to find out that instead of you being always the defendant, that at some point you can be a prosecuting attorney or a judge. At some point when you had the opportunity to expose yourself, they would not allow you to be on certain sides of the equation, but as soon as your daddy messed up, then all of a sudden you have to become the man. Sometimes we make strong men weaker because we pimp them against the strong men that are not doing what you want them to have done. You can't make your boy a man by trying to belittle his father. You can't make your boy a strong man by trying to undermine somebody that you got issues with. You can't make your boy a strong man when the only person he can cut life out of is the person he has his DNA and, gene and the gene genealogical chromosome makeup from. He's got to learn some things about his health, his background, his makeup, his, gen his, his genealogy, his demons, whatever he has to learn what to do and what not to do. You can't make him a strong man by cutting down the only person he's got to talk to about it one day. And you sure can't make him a strong man by denying the fact that he was your strong man for at least 30 minutes one day. Okay, 20 minutes, all right. I don't know about right. I ever want to be. <laughs> he ain't always been bad. <laughs> Stop telling our young men that they can't become what they ought be by you having to whittle down a man in order to try to raise one up. I don't know how this man in the Gadarenes got to be the way he was. I don't know how this man in the Gadarenes got to be crazy, but he wasn't born that way. I don't know how this man in the northern region up here in Gadara, in this upper Palestinian region, I don't know how he got that way. But young men aren't born this way. He still has the characteristics of the things that made him strong, but because somebody jacked him up, he's strong in one sense and crazy in another. Well, the text bears it out. The text bears it out that he did not become strong after he met Jesus. He was strong before he met him. He was up here in these tombs. He was up here making loud noises. He was up here, and they kept putting chains on him. They kept binding him. They kept fettering him. They kept nailing him down. But they look up, and they found out that they couldn't keep him chained because he was a strong man. They tried to chain and fetter him by constructing laws to keep him down but he kept breaking out of them. They kept building schools to keep him ignorant of his potential, but he kept breaking out of them. They organized ghettos to keep him out of their neighborhoods, 
but some of them broke out of them. They arranged economic systems to keep him begging and broke, but he broke out of them. They, they, they developed judicial systems to tear him down and jails to lock him up, but none of it worked. He could not be bound, but he was cutting himself. Other folk couldn't do it, but he was doing it to himself. When other folk tried to chain him, they couldn't do it. But the only thing that did work was when he cut himself or his own people. Other folk could not capture him and keep him, but he could do it to himself. Other people did not have the capacity to be able to minimize him. They tried it with chattel slavery. They tried it by bringing him over middle passes, even though millions died by dysentery and disease, millions more made it and survived. They tried it by taking him away from his family and from his children and from his wife. They tried to take it, you heard, as it was stated in the poem, by making him a breeder and everything else. They tried to do everything they could, but they could not do it. But while others tried to kill him, and he kept multiplying, what happens when he kills himself every weekend? What happens when he believes himself that learning to read, write, and to do arithmetic is acting white? What happens when he begins to believe that putting toxins in your body just because somebody made it legal is going to give you the access to the same jobs that your grandfathers and great-grandfathers died to open up doors for. What happens when you begin to start talking down about your own women? It's one thing when other folk call them names, but it's another thing when they hear you call them. What happens when other people go from beating your women to you beating them yourself? What happens when other people rape you and maim you and begin to do all manners of evil against you and you begin to rape your own people? What happens when you begin to incestuously rape your own kinfolk? What happens when you traffic your own children? Other folk can't do it, but you can do it to yourself. And the text calls it crazy. And if it was crazy in Mark chapter 5, it's crazy in, on October, what's the day? Yeah, right. 2000. It's still, somebody say it's still crazy. But I forgot, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot. Man, somebody should have reminded me. The text didn't start in chapter 5. The text didn't start in Mark 5, 1. The text didn't start with him saying he's crazy. The text didn't start with him acting up. The text didn't start with him breaking chains and cutting himself and crying out loud and making up of people mad and people being scared of him and people ostracizing him and keeping him in dead communities. The text didn't start with him being all jacked up, messed up, and otherwise tore up from the flow up. The text started when Jesus said, I got to go over there. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Here's my next point in case you missed it. No matter how crazy you are in your life, God has always had a vision to about making you stronger. <laughs> when you weren't thinking about it for yourself, when it wasn't on your mind, when it wasn't on your agenda, when you didn't even have it messed up, while you were still smoking and choking and kicking and screaming, when you were doing all your illicit activity, thank God that he always had you on his mind. Verse 35 said, let's go. Hold on. Pause. Wait. Rewind. Mark chapter 4, verse 35 is not the last verse in Mark 4. There are five more verses. 
between Mark 4.35 and Mark 5.1. What was the hindrance? What, took, what was the problem? What was the problem with him wanting to go to the other side and him getting to the other side? I'll tell you what the problem was. He had some church folk that didn't want him to get there. <laughs> I'll wake up the other side of the church now. I said he had some church folk who didn't want to, him to get. Don't you know some of the reasons why we can't get some of our brothers together is the church is supposed to help Jesus on the way is the people who are getting in the way. Y'all know I woke up too early to be playing with you this morning. All right now. Listen, I said they're getting in the way. Jesus takes these prototypes called his disciples and said let's go that's who he's talking to he's talking to the then organized church the ones who he's about to take to become the the new birthers of the church the ones who he's preparing now to lead the opening of the doors of the church these 12 that he has been working with now for some chapters to prepare the way they are the ones that he said let's go to the other side some of them saying why are we leaving this mega church going over somewhere else don't you think we ought to be setting up right here look like you got a bunch of folk right here. They like us over here. We can collect a lot of offering over here. Did you see all them folk up there? Listen, man, we did the two fish five. Man, that was a great trick. Man, did Jesus, can you do that again? Because, man, I'm telling you, we had so many fish sandwiches left over after that. My God, we could sell them sandwiches through the week. And, man, I'm telling you, I, try, I, ain't able, I didn't even make this money tax collecting. I didn't make this money when I was a real fisherman. Give Jesus the high five. He the man. Come on, you got five. Oh, God. Man, listen, let's do this because this is this a do it. Man, listen, we can get Kanye come by and put up with it quiet and we get all kinds of people to come up. Oh man, that's a good, that, listen, we can get some more folk in. You got any more gimmicks like that? You got any more tricks like that? Jesus says, shut up. It wasn't a gimmick. I wasn't tricking nobody. I'm not after multitudes. I'm after ministry. And when you have to ministry, sometimes you don't look for the multitudes. You have to leave them to go where ministry is. Sometimes when you are doing ministry, you don't seek the multitudes. You minister to them if that's where God has you. But when you're following Christ and building strong men, sometimes you leave thousands just to go after one. Oh, you preaching good, pastor. But the church don't like it when you grow down when they trying to. No, they ain't even growing up. They trying to blow up. It's a difference when you trying to blow up instead of grow up. There's a difference between swelling and growth. Just because you have 15 services and people running out the door don't mean you've grown up. And just because you have one service that's 12 hours long don't mean you've grown up. It ain't the length or the amount of time, it's the content that matters. It's not the color of a balloon that makes it rise, it's what kind of gas you got on the inside. Jesus is after ministry. We're after trying to attract the newest, latest, greatest gimmick. To have to prove to somebody else, I got more, I got greater. Listen, you're not somebody just because you got what you think you have. Because anything that time can change ain't that great. Y'all missed what I just said. I said anything you after that time can change must not be all that great. Foster used to have a real big afro. I looked at a few others, but he would happen to be the one in my head. But time gave him a haircut. Come on, help me somebody. <laughs> Deacon Thomas used to have real black hair. But time gave him a rinse. Y'all missing what I'm just saying. I'm going to wake up some more people if y'all keep looking at me like that, all right? Men, stop ducking now. I see y'all looking at me. Time took that six pack and made it a two liter. 
<laughs> uh, there's a whole bunch of folk I could call right now, <laughs> that including me. <laughs> Time took your ability to run a 100-yard dash in so many seconds and minutes, and now you can't walk it in five minutes. Anything time can change, you ought not be spending all your time on. But time can't change the power of your mind. Time can't change the strength of your heart. Time can't change the depth and the power of your ministry. There are some things on the inside that time makes it better. Though our outward man perish, our inward man is being renewed day by day. Strong men spend time on things that are eternal. Because strong men understand that maybe, yes, she did marry the captain of the football team 50 years ago. But one day, he's going to look more like the football than the team. But she'll still love him and not run after some new young quarterback looking person if he spends time developing the man that she loved on the inside. That's the only way strong men get stronger. There's something in you that doesn't have to diminish. There's something about you that doesn't have to get weaker. There's something about you that doesn't have to get older. The church got in the way. The church tried to keep Jesus from getting there. They said we need to stay here. But not only did the church start, try to do it, but the devil himself tried to do it. Oh, yes, he did. Well, where's the devil in the text, Pastor? Because I don't see the devil nowhere in the text in there. All I see is it said that they got on the boat and then they went shipping with Jesus and then it was some other little ships that went along with them and then there was a storm that came up and then the winds and the waves blew. Well, I don't see the devil nowhere. He's all in there. You see, what's wrong with some of us, we keep looking for the devil with red suits and pitchforks and a horn and stuff and don't realize that the devil got in the church first because if Jesus gets on the ship and he's on the way to the other side, why are there other little ships? <laughs> you see, little ships only occur when some folk don't want to go where vision is going, where church is going, leadership is going. Oh, you know, you got little ships on your pew. Little ships are people who tell you to do something different than you hearing coming from the pulpit. Little ships are people who say after we say we're going to do evangelism the God's way and we're going to tithe by giving. Little ships come up with these old cockamamie crazy ideas and say we ain't never did it that way. He wasn't here before. We used to raise a whole lot of money before we started. Look, look at the pressure now. We ain't doing nothing much. Listen, if you go back, let me have. He won't let me do it. I'll raise all kind of money. They'll give if I do this. I got a little chicken eating contest and I promise you people are going to come. I can do it. Shut up! You in the wrong ship. Little ships murmur and complain when things don't go their way. And that's the devil trying to divide the ship. And strong men can't get stronger if they keep hearing people trying to lead them another way when Jesus is on his way to help somebody else. We don't believe in helping crazy people. We believe in helping people who got plenty of money. We don't believe in helping homeless people. We believe in people who already got some clothes and food and place to stay. Well, maybe you're not a church. Maybe you're a club. Because only clubs cater to certain clientele. But Jesus is on the boat that said, whosoever will, let him come. Because I can help anybody and make them become some of them people you're trying to be like. I didn't say they, they got to stay broke if they came in broke. But I can help them to be able to do it in a powerful way. Because I'm up after making strong men stronger. Where is the devil in the text? I tell you where he is. He's in even nature. Because the text says that when Jesus rebuked, hallelujah, the wind and the waves, answer me this question, when is the last time somebody had to rebuke something that was under their control? 
if he had to raise up, they have to wake him up, he had to stand up and tell them behave. Then obviously it was misbehaving. And nature was misbehaving because the devil could see he couldn't stop Jesus by messing with the church folk. He couldn't stop Jesus because of little ships. Some people get discouraged when other folks stop meeting against you and camping against you and start plotting and planning against you. Jesus didn't turn the ship around. He kept on sailing. Some people get mad when they had little chicken meetings and pot and lot meetings on you. Some people throw in the towel and say, I can't take all this. They don't pay me enough for this. Jesus kept on sailing. So the devil got in nature. Devil got in the community. The devil got and other people but Jesus stood up and said I'm not just the Jesus you think I am I'm the one that spat out these seas I'm the one that looked and pushed up the mountains I'm the one that, that howled the winds and when the wind recognized that God was in him and God wasn't playing he said shut up and sit down and the winds behaved how is it that nature does what human beings want When he told the wind to stop and the waves to stop and the storm to cease, the Bible says it lay down like a lamb and behaved because it recognized the master. If nature could recognize the master, how come you don't? My final point. Oh, yeah, I'm, it's a two-part sermon. I'm, I'm going to get to the juicy part at 11 o'clock. <laughs> I'm in chapter 4. I'm going to dig deep in chapter 5 next month. But listen, I'm just telling you, before he even got to the crazy man, the hindrances to the strong man becoming stronger. Last one and I'm done. Jesus gets past disciples who should have been encouraging him or at least asking him a question because they don't know where they're going. I got to throw this in here. I know I'm on my way somewhere. But it's amazing to me how if Jesus is the captain of the ship, how do you know where you're going more than he does? You at least ought to be like a little kid on the ship talking about where we going, Jesus? What time are we going to get there? Hey, Jesus, uh, what, what you doing? Hey, you know, I, I don't think Jesus minds you nagging him as long as you talking to him. Come on. Some of us are afraid to ask questions because we're too busy making statements. And strong men only get stronger when you learn to ask questions when you don't know what you need to know. Stop talking and making statements when questions are the order of the day. When the devil couldn't stop him through church folks' craziness or the storm that got into nature, throwing a cosmic fit. The text says Jesus came to the other side. I would think that it should be over then. And I'll pick up on how the man got stronger eventually, but there's one thing that I need to point up before I take my seat. Are y'all interested and want to know what else could have stopped him? What else could have stopped him was the man himself. Watch this, Percy, because this has floored me. I read it in the text. It looked like the man had gotten himself together when Jesus got to him. It looked like the man had gotten himself when the man had got to him because the text says that when the man saw Jesus, he ran to him. Is that in your Bible? Or did you, you closed it again, didn't you? Mm -hmm. I mean, verse 6. It says he saw Jesus when he was afar off. I thought he got happy because Jesus had him on his agenda. I thought he was happy because Jesus had him on his mind. I thought he was happy, Mignon, because Jesus had decided to go through a church storm to get there. He decided to get through it's some craziness that was happening on the ship with the other little ships. And let me just throw in this for free. All them other little ships never made it to the other side. Because if you ain't on the boat Jesus is on, you're going to die in every storm. But let me just say to you, he made it. He was there. I thought he was happy. But Gene, here's what I found out. He saw him. 
He ran to him. He worshiped him and cried out with a loud voice, what do I have to do with you? Uh-oh. Rewind. Moonwalk again, y'all. Just I was always done. All right, here I come. He ran to him. That looks good, don't it? He worships him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise him. Praise him. That's the kind of man we want, ain't it? But in the next voice, he's saying, what I got to do with you? Be careful, men, that you show your schizophrenia when you act one way in church and another way as soon as you leave his presence. Because a man who's a real strong man is a consistent man. He speaks with one voice, not multiple voices. When you still speak with multiple voices, it's a sign of schizophrenia. It's a sign of being bipolar. It's a sign of that you've got still some issues going on. And the fact is, is that until you learn how to speak with one voice, you cannot speak the strength that God wants you to have. And one moment he's worshiping, and the other moment he's wicked. And one moment he's lifting up his hands, the other moment he's pulling down his pants. And one moment he's having the ability to get high in holiness, and the other minute he's getting high on cush. On one moment he's dealing with how he can run with the Lord and the next minute he's running with his boys and until you can live a consistent life you still manifest crazy behavior as a matter of fact his worship was a mask for his demons thank God Jesus recognized it Thank God Jesus says, I got here for this case just like this. This is a serious case because the real serious case is some people say, look, I ain't trying to act like I got, I'm right. I know I'm wrong. The serious cases of people, you know, people who deal with the fact that, listen, I ain't trying to act like, listen, I know I'm jacked up. But the cases that are harder to deal with are people who act like they got it all together, but they really still messed up. Have you ever known somebody who went to the doctor who know they sick but because they don't want to be there and don't want to pay the bill they keep telling them they all right they keep telling you ain't nothing wrong they got every sign and symptom running all over them but they still trying to convince you and everybody else that everything's wrong there's something wrong when the fact is you know something's wrong but you are afraid to go talk to somebody about it who can help you get it right that's what was wrong with this man it was necessarily a physical situation but his mental social and spiritual life was jacked up and it was crying out here's the good news jesus ain't looking and listening to what you're saying with your mouth He's looking and listening to what you're doing and saying about yourself and people like you. And this is where I pick it up because Jesus only went to one question. What is your name? Give God praise. In part two, let me just say to you, I will... Look at the fact that you'll never be able to get rid of something you're not willing to name. You'll never be able to deal with something that will help you to become stronger if you're not willing to stop misnaming it and give it its proper name. And then you'll also come to discover that when you think that the church or the people or the family or the folk who you thought would help you get it together have been just waiting on you to get it together, you might find out that some of them were profiting off of your craziness. Some of them ain't going to like it when you get yourself together. I wish I could tell you differently, but when you read that text and you get down, it says when the man was clothed and in his right mind got it all together, it says, and the people got scared of him. What do you mean got scared of him? They should have been scared of him. But no, people ain't scared of you as long as you acting crazy and profiting for them. But when you get yourself together 
and you no longer become a threat to yourself, but a threat to the people who God ordained you to be strong to stand against, standing up for righteousness and standing up for justice and standing up for that. When you stand up and speak up, when you see people who are good men getting shot in their own home and other folk didn't have to make the conviction but your own people sometime afraid to give you the ability to see that there was worth of your life by failing to give sentences that meet the crime that was justice when women get shot and killed playing with their nephews in their own home and men don't rise up in the streets everywhere and shut down everything and anybody and say you did it to our young boys but I'll be doggone if you do it to our daughters there's something wrong bipolar a little crazy when you let it happen to yourself but there's an answer name it Claim it. Bring it. Offer it to the Lord. And do like the man did. Let Jesus give you your name back. What is your name? Today, if you can't say that my name is son of God, child of God, saved of God, you might still have some craziness, but the question is, who's your daddy? Who's your real father? Who's your eternal father? Not the one that left you, not the one that hurt you, not the one that forsake you, but the one who said, come unto me. All ye that are crazy. And I'll help you get your life straight. The one who said, not y'all, but all have sinned. Newsflash. Everybody in here crazy. Some kind of crazy. Spinner said, everybody plays the fool sometime. No exception to the rule. Listen, baby. <laughs> I'm going to get you one way or the other to hear what I'm saying. Everybody has a crazy problem. But they only want to answer. Because you're still strong, but God can make you stronger. You still got worth, but God can make it worth something. I don't want my strength just to last this life. I want a power and a strength that will be good for eternal life. It starts with a relationship with the one who can get me straight. The doors of the church are open. And if you make today a decision to follow him,